Tonight, I'm going to continue talking about uh, what we've been talking about now for six weeks, the God of the resurrection. If there's ever been a time in our life that we need to know that there is a God that's bigger than our circumstances, a God that's bigger than what we think is the most bleak, the most uh, dead in. That's a kind of a unique way of saying it, dead in. But yet, we have a God that goes beyond the dead end. We have a God that gets cranked up and started. God gave us life. And God allowed sin to take life. But we have a God, a Redeemer God, who did great things to make it possible, not just that we have life, but we have an abundant life. We could say eternal life. I'm, I'm sorry that, that uh, a virus took Scott Crane's life. I'm grateful that he's more alive now than he's ever been. That's what we have. And in part of that, we call that hope. But hope is not from the funeral service forward. Hope needs to be alive now. I don't know if, I don't know if you caught that. Hope needs to be what's uh, moving us in every act that we do today and how we react today in the impulse of our heart in the desire to honor him and bring him glory and to stay humble before him and to seek his face. The, the desire to do that should be the power of God manifest, Emmanuel, God with us, El Elyon, the most high God. He is El Shaddai. He is the most powerful and we need to live according to that. So in the areas of our life that we're facing, what seems like the point of no return, we need to understand that salvation is the definition of there is no place of the point of no return for the Christian. There is no circumstance too big. There is no difficulty too hard. There is no burden or weight too heavy there is no opportunity that he will not join us there there is no prayer that he doesn't hear and answer according to his will we have an active God and we have precision in a prayer life God takes our prayers joins it with our faith moves it through his will and it hits the exact place that he intended it and it hits on time, every time, all the time. Now, that was a good point right there. I don't know if y'all caught that or not. I'm going to brag on myself. Y'all don't ever brag on me, so i got to brag on myself. Not one amen out of the whole room. Listen, it would be wonderful if we would wake up every morning with a clear understanding that we serve the great, big God of the resurrection. It would be a wonderful thing not to be caught off our game or surprised or, or, or delayed or worried or anxious at all over anything that we face because we know that there's a God who is working that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Acting upon our, that, that hope that we have in God. Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is writing a letter to the, to the new believers at Corinth, a Greek city, a pagan city. He has come in, a city of over 100,000 people. He, he just left the biggest failure in his ministry, which was at the, the city of, of, of Athens. No church formed in Athens. Just about every place Paul went, he left believers, and the, and the living church uh, began in that place. But in Athens, no, not so much. So he left what seemed like a failure, found himself in a place totally empty of everything of human strength and wisdom. God did an amazing work to call them from darkness to light. But because they're new believers, they're, they're swayed by every wind and every new doctrine. And some people came in, uh, some saved Sadducees. Y'all remember the Sadducees, don't you? 
They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the resurrection. So they're coming in, and, and they may be sharing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they say, hey, no resurrection. Now, I'll tell you as a preacher, that gets you, that gets you dander up real quick. What do you mean there's no resurrection? If there's no resurrection, what in the world are we talking about? The one thing that separates Christianity from every other religion is the resurrection. So, so Paul, in, in, in 1 Corinthians, is, is doing a lot of teaching, and he's, 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 it's really doctrinal because he's having to straight out, straighten out some very backwards living. When we come to 1 Corinthians 15, he now is addressing those people who are teaching that there is no resurrection. If you're not at 1 Corinthians 15 right now, you've been wasting your time. That's, that's, I gave you eight minutes of an introduction. Let's jump into it. You there say amen. Verse 1, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. Now here he's saying, this is the gospel, and he's speaking to the church, the believers in Corinth. Now they should know how they got saved. I hear people talk, and they say, well, I don't know what to say to somebody. To, I, I don't know how to witness to anybody. Did you get saved? Yeah. How would you get saved? Tell somebody else how you got saved. Brag on Jesus, who he is, what he did. That's a good way to witness. Everybody who's been saved has a testimony. Amen? I wasn't going to let you get by without saying amen to that. Everybody who's been saved has a testimony. So he's reminding them here in verse 1. I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. The gospel hadn't changed. You know what I preach to you. You know what you believe. You know how you prayed. You know what you were hoping in. That hadn't changed. He said it's also the same according to Scripture. Verse 3, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. You received it at my preaching, but I didn't give you something that I'm not, don't also have a personal testimony to. And here he says that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He's talking about prophecy of Old Testament. And he said prophecy of Old Testament told us that Jesus had to die for our sins and that he was buried. And then he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He says very plainly, Scripture has told us, not, you, you know it, you believed it, but Scripture told us that these things had to be. You, I just got on to you. Well, I didn't get on to you. I was just saying, um, did you get to 1 Corinthians 15? Now I'm going to tell you to turn. I want you to, Look at one of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. I could pick a ton of Old Testament scripture to talk about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But I just love Isaiah 53. I, I'm one of those, any excuse I can get to Isaiah 53 is pretty good. Y'all say amen when you get there. I, if you're not there, say wait. All right. Isaiah 53. 700 years. Y'all good with 700 years before Christ? Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, y'all know who that he is, don't you? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. My goodness, wasn't the religion pretty dry? That Jesus came to fulfill the Jewish people with all their, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you know, tithing every little small thing, but but, but really forgot the full intent of the heart of the law. He has no form 
or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He didn't come charismatic. He didn't come the most beautiful. All those pictures that people in their own mind's eye try to depict of Jesus to, to describe. We don't know what he looked like. But he went out of the way. Come on now. How many of you, if you could have pictured, if you could choose how you would look, would you look differently? Right? But Jesus, the author, could. But he chose not to come anything other than average. When you looked at him, there, there was nothing of the human element that would just jump out at you. But my goodness, when you saw the glory of God on him. Wow. Verse 3. He is despised. He allowed it. Rejected by men. One of the phrases that we know of, but I don't think we meditate on enough, that, that second phrase in verse 3, a man of sorrows. Once again, if you could have chosen your path of life, how many of you would, chose, would choose a path of sorrows? How many of you would choose to have the great wealth of the world, the great talent of the world? How many of you would choose the perfection of the world, the education of the world? How many of you would choose to be a man of sorrows? Most of the time, we move out of the way so that we would not have sorrows. Most of the prayer requests that we hear are, take this away so that I do not have to suffer. Acquainted with grief, firsthand experience. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Instead of embracing him, we walked away from him. Can I say it this way? We overlooked him. The charismatic one we're drawn to. The charismatic one we can't get enough of. But this is one, I think that sometimes Jesus human down his sermons. I know he did. Even to the place of, of of doing it in a parable so that you had to have a hunger to hear. If you came about it casually, you might miss it altogether. Intently he did that. Look at the end of verse 3. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has bore our griefs. Anybody here have grief? Come on, those watching on, online, can, can we talk about grief? Carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. Wow. God smitten God, the Son, Jesus Christ. God afflicted God, the Son, Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. Bruised, beaten, and received a bruise for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like dumb, stupid, ignorant sheep, have gone astray. You don't think I had added that correctly. Let me just ask you, how many of you believe in God? How many of you believe in God with all your heart? How many have gone through experiences where, where God has, has showed you his grace and his goodness, where you knew, you looked at it, and it was unbelievably God? And yet, instead of being shaped by that, we chase sin. Either sin of commission... We look at it and still want to sin. Or we're so tied up in our own stuff, sin of omission. Things that we should do that we don't do. Yeah, we're stupid, ignorant sheep. 
we've all gone, a, gone away. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Christ, the iniquity of my stupidity. He was oppressed, beaten down. Have, to know how I feel, he had to go through the pressures that I feel and beyond. I believe the greatest pressure that Jesus faced was on the cross when he said those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Speaking of the place when our sin was placed upon him. And there was a break in the, in, in the Trinity because God cannot look at sin and Jesus became sin. He felt the oppression of my sin. And the worst thing about hell is no hope because that is the place where God is not. And to, to feel that pressure being placed upon him. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't defend himself. He didn't say it's somebody else's fault. He just kept his mouth shut and fulfilled it. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. I think that's one of the most powerful things. John 5 said, he did, you do not bear witness of yourself. Someone else will bear witness of me. And the Holy Spirit bore, bore witness. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. But I bear witness, and you bear witness. Verse 8, he was taken from prison. Is that not correct? And from judgment. Was he not judged by Pilate and those that shouted, crucify him, crucify him? Who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. I think that means death. Does it not? For the transgression of my people, he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked. Who was buried on both sides of him? Two thieves. They took him down from the cross. Two thieves beside him. But then it says, but with the rich at his death. Now he was there surrounded by two thieves, two criminals, two deserving of death, but with the rich, Joseph of Arimathea, put in a rich man's grave because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased by the way, if y'all want to do a Bible study sometime, you just take that one phrase there. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. You study on that a while. Meditate on that a while. Think about Hebrews 12. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now sat down at the right hand of the Father. For the joy. It pleased the Lord. You know why it pleased the Lord? It made a way for me and you to have salvation. It thrills the Lord that we have salvation. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. There was no other way. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. By the way, my, I'm there. I'm part of that. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The joy that was set before him. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. It was worth it. Wow. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. Aren't you glad you're one? May we never get over the fact that God's grace was sufficient for us to extend such great salvation. For he shall bear their iniquities. Change that to my iniquities. Put your name there. He bore your iniquities. What a powerful chapter. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. My God. 
My God, why have you forsaken me? But before that, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Today, you shall be with me in paradise. I think um, when you come to that place, when you are surrounded by people who uh, think little of Christ, and they have question marks about Christianity, I think we should do what Paul did in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, to this group, he is saying, remember, this is how you got saved. If you're talking to someone that hasn't been saved, they're not there yet. But he, he says, this is the plainness of the gospel, that he died for your sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again. And then take it a little bit further, 1 Corinthians, verse number 5. He was seen by... Peter, Cephas, a great believer who denied. And yet now, there's something different about Peter. Now his testimony is not wavering. So one who knew him forsook him, who has definitely been changed by the resurrection. If he was the way he was before, he'd still be the coward, cursing. But now the resurrection, salvation changed him. Seen by the 12. That includes Thomas. Man, what was it like when they're in the room, the 11 of them are in the room, and the one who doesn't need a door because he is the door just walks in and says, hey guys. The first time, Thomas wasn't there. The second time, he's there, and, and the Lord says, hey, come here. And he probably said, oh, no, 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 come here, Thomas. Look, right, see that? Look. Well, I showed you my pump. Yeah. See, see my side? To see the scars? It's me, legitimate me, the one who said, I will not believe unless... Now he believes. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. This is most likely close to the ascension. You don't get a figment of your imagination in 500 people. 500 people with the same story. And, and if you want to go ask them, most of them are still alive. He's telling the people at Corinth, go ask them. They're still here. They'll tell you they saw him. If you go to a trial today, we need an eyewitness. Y'all good with that? If you have 500 eyewitnesses come in the room who give you the exact same testimony, is that going to sway you a juror? Just let the proof be the proof. The resurrection changes everything. After that, he was seen by James. Why is James important? This is the half-brother of Jesus, most likely the, the firstborn of Joseph and Mary. Jesus was born of Mary and the Holy Spirit. This is the one born of Joseph and Mary who was not a believer until he saw the risen Lord. Then it says, then by the apostles. Matter of fact, to be an apostle, you had to see the risen Lord. I, I know there are a lot of people today who are calling themselves apostles. I've seen his spirit in my heart, but I've never seen the risen Lord. There's a difference. There's a biblical concept to that. I think they're taking Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 a little too far by bringing it modern. That's my opinion. That's a sermon for another day. Verse 8. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one, as one born out of due time. But don't stop there, verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abor abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. He's like, look, 
you know my story. I was preaching to you. But, but understand, remember where I was. I was the one out trying to kill people. I was the, where, the one when Stephen was stoned. I was there. I was cheering them on when they threw the rocks. I was going to Damascus to get more. But I met the Lord there. I saw the risen Lord. My life's never been the same. It's a life that's been changed. The greatest testimony of salvation is someone who's been changed by the gospel. Not changed by the church. Not changed by their parents. Not changed by society. But were changed by a head-on collision with a holy God who became alive in them. You can lose the church, but if you got God in your heart, you're not going to lose God. We can go to war. Someone can be captured. Someone can be put in a prison. Someone cannot have a Bible. Someone cannot have anyone else around them, but they can still have God there. Amen? Nobody else can do it for you. Lance, you got three precious little girls that are not there yet. They're not at the age of accountability yet, but that day will come, and you'll want it for them so very much, and you'll talk to them, and you're going to read the Bible to them, and you're going to love on them, but they've got to make that decision for themselves. They have got to come with a head-on collision with the Holy God. You cannot change that, that wooing of the Spirit. You cannot change that repentance that must happen. You cannot change that belief that must happen. But if that happens, it lasts forever. You don't get saved, lose saved. Get saved, lose saved. Get saved, lose saved. I got it. I'm having a great day. Praise God. I'm down. I'm depressed. I, I, nobody loves me. Woe is me. I lost my salvation. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. He that came to give us everlasting life. Check out John 3, 16. Not temporary life. Everlasting life. If there was no death, there would be no need for resurrection. You take all the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, and he's building upon it to the place that he gets to the end of that chapter and says, we're going to be with him too. Trumpet will sound. Dead in Christ shall rise first. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. We have looked in the Old Testament. We have looked in the New Testament. We saw Jesus show up at a funeral and have a resurrection. Amen. We saw a chief Jew with a daughter that was sick. And Jesus went to the house and told the rest of them, Y'all get out of here. Y'all unbelievers, y'all get out of here. And he went up there and tenderly said to that dead child, little girl, I say to you, arise. And when the Holy Spirit took those words, it made them alive. And that little girl got up. He went to the tomb of a man who had been in the tomb for four days and called him back to life. And when he gave his life and was buried, the same Holy Spirit put that life back within him as well. We do not serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. Amen? I don't care what man says. He's already touched me here. Let's pray. Father, change us. We thank you for the change that came at salvation. Now, Lord, help us to live out the boldness that we had then when we turned from sin and believed in you and cried out to you and asked you to do for us what only you could do. Now let us live out every day the hope we found that we know, and Lord, help us to live it out every day in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for coming to God's house tonight.